So great to be here uh, with the, my favorite family in all of South Carolina, the Hope family. And so greetings to everyone online, those in Simpsonville, those Greenville people who I know you're watching at home, even though we'll be together tonight. So it's just so, so great to be together. What an incredible time to be alive. Isn't this an incredible time to love Jesus, follow Jesus, trust Jesus every single day of our lives? And what I want to do in the time that we have together today is help you see Jesus in situations where you feel or you sense or you're afraid that Jesus is no longer there. Spirit of the living God, fall anew on us. Give us the revelation of Jesus. Amen. Take your Bible and turn with me, if you would, to Luke, the 24th chapter. Luke, the 24th chapter. Have you ever had a this changes everything moment in your life? Just think about it for a second. This changes everything. I know one of my this changes everything is when I said these two words, I do. That changed everyone. Everything, and so if you've experienced, I do, you know it changed everything. And in my case, for the good, after 42 years, and it just gets getting better and better and better and better. And so another this changes everything is, it's a girl, or it's a boy, and it just changed everything, didn't it? And hopefully for the better, one of the most difficult changes everything is when you receive the doctor's word, he's gone. And it changes everything. My hope is that you also have experienced when you said to Jesus, I'm yours. And it changed everything. Well, our story today is of two men who in an instance, everything changed in one moment. And I believe that you're going to relate to this. This is the 24th chapter of the book of Luke. The resurrection has just occurred, and we have two men as the focus of our story. Chapter 24, verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with one another about everything that had happened. Let me get this Bible up here everything that had happened, and they were talking and discussing these things with each other. And Jesus himself came up and walked with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, you could read they are kept from recognizing him, or they didn't recognize him, or for whatever reason, he's right there and they don't recognize him. They, and he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still and their faces downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and you do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, asked Jesus? Everybody, did you know this? Jesus will ask you questions he already knows the answer to. You know, when he asked Elijah, what are you doing here? He knew exactly what he was doing there. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God. And all the people and the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it was the third day since all of this took place. And in addition, some of the women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find the body. And they came and they told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, how foolish you are and slow to heart to believe that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and enter then into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures 
concerning himself. Can you imagine that sermon? He started with Moses and all of the prophets, and he explained in every scripture concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. It's, it's nearly evening and the day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Can you imagine that moment, everybody? He gives them the bread, their eyes are open and he disappears from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the road and opened up the scriptures to us? And they got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem where they found the 11 with them assembled together and saying, it's true, it's true, the Lord, he, he's risen. And he appeared to Simon and then, and then the two were told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them as he broke the bread, as he broke the the bread. What an incredible story. These guys, their whole world has just flipped upside down. All of their hopes were dashed. Everything they'd hoped for was over. We can relate to this more than many of you think. A this changes everything moment, the crucifixion. In your life, it might be when your spouse said, I don't love you anymore, changed everything. It might be when the doctor said, as they did an ultrasound, we can't hear a heartbeat. And it changed everything. And these men had experienced the crucifixion and on their way from a funeral, they had lost all hope. Notice that the center of everything was their struggle. We thought, we thought that he would be the one. Have you ever found yourself saying this? But, but Lord, I, I, I thought, and, and, and we prayed, and we even fasted, and we waited, and we've waited, and we've waited. We thought this was the time that you were going to break through. They had hoped that Jesus was the Messiah. No small issue that they were talking about. And all of a sudden, they're walking this way and Jesus sidles up to them and they say what local people say, you must not be from around here, are you? Because you haven't known what's going on. Haven't you seen the posts? Haven't you read the news? Jesus went with them seven miles and they couldn't recognize him. Seven miles. How often we walk with Jesus and we don't recognize him. I want to tell you, in your life, there are many, many times and will be more times when you will be walking and Jesus will be walking with you, but you won't recognize. See, they should have known him. They really should have known them, shouldn't they? Even if they couldn't see him, the scripture says this, by his conversation, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, they recognize me. Jesus said that in John chapter 10. You will know me by my voice and I'm gonna speak to you. And then you add what he spoke. So not only the conversation, but by his, not only his conversation, but also by his content, they should have known that this was Jesus. He's talking about Moses. He's, uh, maybe he, in Genesis, he, he may have shared that the, the seed of the serpent and her seed would crush his head and, and, and that he would, he, would, uh, he would destroy the enemy, pierced for your transgressions in Psalm 22 and on through the Old Testament. They should have recognized him because of the content, but they were blind. Sometimes Jesus can be so, so close to us and we're blind. Well, why were they blind? There are several common reasons. 
The first is this. The disciples were blinded by their pain. Did you know pain will blind you? And they were blinded by their pain. They had watched him die. Now, if you look at some of medieval art, you see Jesus hanging on a cross, and there's this little trickle of blood that comes down here, and there's this little trickle of blood that comes out of his hands or his side. But the scripture tells you the crucifixion was a train wreck. It was a butchering. Uh, Isaiah says he was beyond recognizing, more marred. He was hamburger, more marred than any man so that you could not even recognize him. Do you you know why? Because the Romans were experts at killing, murdering, torturing people. And this classic methodology of crucifixion took things to a whole nother level. They had this double S scenario where they would place your foot over your other foot and then they'd stretch your arm this way so your whole body was twisted. Your body's going this way because of your leg and yet this way because of your arm. And if you can imagine a nail driven through the top of your foot that you were supported on and then by your arms after you had been whipped and tortured, just to lift your chest to breathe would be agonizing, searing pain. But the moment you did that and let down, the suffocation would begin all over again, over and over, every single breath. They had been there. They had seen it. They would turned their eyes away. They'd smelled the blood in that place. And that's why they were blinded by their pain. Their whole world was ended. Pain will blind you to the presence of Jesus. Some of you have experienced that, and some of you are experiencing it right now. In the night watch, you're saying, Jesus, where are you? When are you going to come through? When are you going to show yourself? And those questions are welcomed by God. And these men were right in this place. If you can't see the presence of God, you can feel very, very hopeless. In spite of Jesus' promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm there by your side. I will not move. I will not leave. Philip Yancey In his book, Where is God When It Hurts, says, I'll tell you where he is, where he's always been, where he will always be, side by side with you, but you can't see because pain and circumstances can blind you. Too often at that moment, we rush to why rather than asking where or who. Why are you allowing this? You know what I've discovered in my life and many situations of difficulty? God rarely, if ever, is going to answer why. But he will answer who, and he will answer where. Where are you, Jesus? I had a prof in seminary, Dr. Mulholland, whose son had to go through a routine surgery, but it was terrifying for him to have his appendix taken out. And he, at the end of his surgery, was in post-op, and uh, Dr. Mulhall worked out so he could hold his little son in his arms, and his son would come out of the anesthesia, and he'd say, Dad, Dad, where are you? Where are you? Don't leave me. Where are you, Dad? And he was crying that, and he was screaming that as as his father was holding him. And his daddy would say, I'm here, honey, I'm here. I'm here, I'm not, I'm not leaving you. But even that close, even being carried, even being touched, pain does this to us. We need to recognize that. We need to realize that in the midst of pain, it may be hard to see Jesus. Can any of you or any of you out there online relate to this? Where are you, Jesus. Jesus can relate to it, my God, my God, why why have you forsaken me? You could say it this way, my God, where, where are you in the midst of his pain? 
I know in our battles with breast cancer, the first cancer that she battled, my wife, God was there all the time. And can you imagine her shock when in the second battle, which was many times worse, she couldn't find him. God, where are you? And We learn from a very wise, compassionate mentor. Sometimes when you're seeking God the most, he seems to be the most absent. But if you'll be patient, often rather than coming to you, he'll come in from the side. One point, the way he came in from the side when my wife was at her lowest was starting to show her little hearts everywhere. Now, the first one was interesting and nice on the beach, but then the second one, and then the 87th one, and then the 90th one, and it went on and on and on. But Lord, why haven't you taken the pain? And the answer was, because I'm giving you these hearts. But I want the pain to go away. I want you to know my heart. He came in from the side. The other reason they didn't recognize him was because of their preconceived view of religion. Their preconceived mindset. Did you know your mindset influences everything that you do? And that's why God calls us to renew our minds. You see, there were two schools of Jewish thought. The first was that the Messiah King was coming that the rod of iron coming out of his mouth and he would vanquish his enemies and, and the, 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 the ancient doors and the gates be lifted up that the king of glory may come in and show retribution to his enemies, a political figure. This was so common that the disciples at the ascension of Jesus after he'd resurrected, they had one question for him. Do we take over the government now? I know you all can't relate to this at all. You just, you just can't relate to it. But can you actually believe there are Christians who actually believe the government will save them? This is crazy, isn't it? <clears throat> and that's what those disciples believed. And so this was a mentality and a mindset that the Messiah would be a political figure, but there was also the evidence in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be a suffering servant and be crushed by God on behalf of people. Despised and rejection, a man of sorrows intimately acquainted with grief. And in their mindsets, often these two views never came together. So one of the reasons they were blinded was because they thought the promise was that this Messiah would be transformed, ride a horse right now and tell Rome to get out of Israel. But the other part was exactly what they saw. For it pleased the Lord to crush him, to make him an offering on our behalf. Did you know people still miss Jesus today because of their wrong views? of what he's like? Did you know this is still very, very common? Some see Jesus as someone they can command because they've learned his word and they can actually command him to do what he said. By the way, try that with your dad at home. You know, I know I'm bumping some people, but I, I've been sent to make you uncomfortable. The other view of Jesus is that Jesus has really come to make me happy and that God's desire and design for me is to have a happy life, a blessed life, a favored life, and this is the ultimate goal, happy and wealthy, and that if I am right with God, I will never suffer. As a matter of fact, I'll never get sick. If you are really right with God, you will never get sick. I wish I could find that in the Bible, but I can't. Now, what I can find in the Bible is Jesus wants us to stand for wellness. He wants to pray us to pray. He, he uh, gives us sowing and reaping and all of it. But if you view God as the one who is going to make you happy, you will miss him. And you will miss Jesus in all of his glory and his power and his beauty. Some view God as the one who will rescue me 
in every single situation, who will not allow my family members to die, who will not allow bad things to happen to me. And then, unfortunately, when those things do, not if, they find themselves saying, I can't serve a God who... The whole process of deconstruction finds its place there. I can't serve a God who doesn't rescue me when I ask him to. I can't serve a God who lets my child become a prodigal. I can't serve a God who. And so because of this, they were blinded to seeing Jesus. And because of this, many miss the, re the real presence of Jesus beyond the emotions of a worship set. Did you know there was lots of emotion in our worship set and then there were moments of presence? Did you feel that? Emotion, presence, emotion, presence. It's really amazing, isn't it? Some just feel the emotion and not the presence because they're holding on to a wrong view of God. And both views of the suffering servant and the reigning king were true, but Jesus said, oh, you're foolish, foolish people. Didn't you see he had to suffer before the glory? Watch this, everybody. It's real important. He had to suffer before he entered into his glory. Then what happens next in our story? This is so incredible. They didn't recognize him. They were blinded, and now Jesus is revealed in the most crazy, everybody. This is craziness. Why is it crazy? Because first he's walking with them and they don't recognize him. He's speaking and they don't understand or recognize his voice. Then he preaches the greatest sermon ever preached in all of creation, a sermon about himself through every book of the Old Testament, and they don't get it. That doesn't encourage me very much because I am not preaching that sermon, and you may not get it. <clears throat> but I'm praying because he's here that you're going to get it. And so we read in our story this most unusual thing. Here he is. He acts as if he's going to go on as they head into the city. Did you know Jesus will act sometimes? So that you'll say, don't, 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 don't leave. You remember on the sea, uh, one of the stories, they see him and he acted as if he would keep on going beyond them. You know why? He wants you to want him. Not just use him. That song is true. I want you to want me. This is Jesus' song to us. I want you to want me. He does. He wants that. And so he acts as if he's going, and they forcefully say, you can't go. And then he goes in, and he does what no guest is supposed to do. Did you notice it? Because they don't see him as Jesus. They sit down. He takes the bread. He blesses the bread, he breaks the bread, and he gives it to them, and their eyes are open. It's Jesus. Oh, my goodness, it's him. And then he's gone. It's just, this is an incredible story. He took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, he gave it to them, boom. And their eyes were open, and he left them. What was it about his table manner, his rhythm, that was greater than them not being able to see him for seven miles as he preached? He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it to them, and their eyes were open, and they saw him. Would you say that with me? He took it. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it, and their eyes were open, and he left them. When was the last time you ate? Did you thank God when you ate? Do you often thank God? Here's a good question. When had the disciples last eaten? 
chapter 22, if you have a paper Bible, they actually make these. They're paper Bibles, and they're, they're cool, okay? Chapter 22, verse 18, for I tell you again, I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19, and he took the bread and gave thanks, blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. He took that bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he, well, I, it's probably a Luke thing. It's probably a Luke thing. Let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 14, okay? Let's check it out and see if this is more than just Luke because, you know, the disciples saw things a particular way. And so Matthew chapter 14, we're gonna look at verse 19. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke the loaves and he gave the loaves to them and everyone was fed. Are you seeing something? He takes it, he blesses it, he breaks it and he gives it to them. Could it be this table manner is a visible demonstration of a divine order that reveals Jesus? Could it be that this table manner is a demonstration of a divine order that reveals Jesus? What if it's a process a pattern that all of us must experience with Jesus if you're ever fully to recognize him and then experience his great destiny for you. If, if God is ever to reveal Jesus clearly to us in great and significant ways and use us, you and I must experience the order of the breaking of the bread. Takes the bread, blesses the bread, breaks the bread, gives the bread away. When you start thinking about this, this is so interesting. You start looking at the characters of scripture. Moses, did you know what Moses means? Drawn out. You know what it means? Taken. God took Moses out of the river and then he put Moses in Pharaoh's house and Moses was blessed, blessed, blessed. And then Moses took things into his own hands and Moses was broken. How long was he broken? 40 years. That's a long breaking, isn't he? And then Moses comes back and God gives him away and he rescues the Hebrew people from their bondage. If you and I want to be used mightily by God and see Jesus more clearly, his presence, then we have to start to recognize a pattern in the good that we're experiencing in life and in the most painful, terrible, awful seasons of our life. Samuel comes to Jesse's house. Do you have sons? They line up, all of them putting their head forward to get oiled to be king. He runs out of sons, and then Samuel says, do you have any more sons? Oh, I just have one. He's a boy out in the field. Bring him here. He brings him there, and God takes him and makes him king when he's just a kid. And then he blesses David. We see this so profoundly. He blesses him and he kills the giant and everyone sings his praises and it's awesome. And then for the next 15 years, he breaks him and breaks him and then breaks him. Another man takes his wife. His men turn on him to stone him. He's on the run living in cages, ca uh, caves. He has to encourage himself because no one else will. A and we see this over and over and over. And then after 15 years, everybody, in Hebron, he is anointed king for seven years and then for 33 more years, he's king 
And his kingdom, God says, will be an everlasting kingdom. And you're here right now because of the blessing of David. Did you know that? This is the Davidic kingdom through our Messiah, Jesus. You're here because he was willing to be broken. Well, is that just a few? No, wait a second. Joseph, he was the favorite son. Uh, He was taken, given a dream, and then he was blessed. They put this beautiful, his dad put this beautiful robe on him. Do you remember that? And then his brothers hated him, and they threw him in prison. And so he went from the pit to Potiphar's house to the prison for 13 years, everybody. Have you been facing your struggle for a year? Two, three, five, 13, 15, do you see that? 40, 40 years? God is showing us patterns of breaking. What about Jesus? He was taken placed in a womb. He blessed him. Everyone spoke well of him when he was a kid. He's 12 years old in the temple. Where did he get this wisdom? Simeon says, this is the Lord's Christ. Anna in the temple says, the Lord's Christ. And then on his debut, after coming out of the wilderness, he goes into the synagogue. He unrolls the scroll of Isaiah 61. He reads it. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he says, this is fulfilled now in your hearing. The kingdom of God has come. And then they talked a little bit. And that debut ended with them forcefully leading him to a cliff outside the city to throw him down and kill him. And God allowed him to be broken and broken and denied and broken and bloodied and down and up and down, over, and over, broken. All the way. And then right where our story is, he's alive. The giving away has begun. alive because of it. Because he was willing to be taken and blessed. Oh, so broken. And then given away. Do you want to see Jesus more clearly? Do you want to experience his presence more consistently? Do you want to be used by God, the true and living God, more powerfully? Then you must be willing to go through the order of the breaking of the bread. Jesus put it this way. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. In the kingdom of God, none of us are exempt from suffering. Jesus promises all of us will suffer. The question is, will you say it's because I don't have faith? Will you say it's because I'm not obedient? Or will you say, we don't understand this, but we know that God works everything for the good of those who love him. Everything for the good. 
And the thing he uses the most are the things that break us. The deaths, the losses, the PTSD, no matter what it is, God is in the process right now in your life of either taking you, some have just met the G- Jesus and you're so excited, blessing you, you're growing, the whole world is astounding, you're forgiven, you're walking in it, you've just been filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we hit these walls. And God is aware of the wall. He doesn't even need to create them. This world is broken. They're going to come to you. The question is, how will you deal with them? Will you curse God? Will you blame God? Will you blame yourself? Will you blame the church? Or will you say, this is my season of suffering. I know you're here. Because you said you would never leave me, never forsake me. And so I'm going to hold on this month, this season of chemotherapy, this year of grief over the loss of my spouse, son, daughter. I'm not letting go of you. I'm not, I'm not going to let go of you. Because I know after the breaking... You're going to give me away. Not with pat, trite answers. If you just have more faith, you you don't have to go through what I went through. It's not true. But with the experience of now, you can say, in everything and through everything, God is faithful and will never leave you. And if you don't know that or experience it, let me just be with you now. I'll just be his representative. Here's my invitation and challenge to release inaccurate images of God in your life and realize you are in a pattern, a rhythm that's ancient. I wish I could tell you you go through it once. I wish I could tell you it's linear. It's not, but these components happen over and over again. He will take you out of the mess that you're in and put you in recovery and it's incredible and he will bless you. But then he'll allow you to be broken. And then he'll give you away if you don't give up on him. If you're willing to pray this prayer with me, God is going to do something right now in this moment because you're praying it with revelation. The same spirit of Jesus who is right there on the road to Emmaus, is right here. And here's the prayer that I'm going to have you repeat. Don't do it now. Listen to me. Lord, take me. Some of you are holding back. Lord, bless me. Lord, break me. Lord, give me away. And let me see Jesus. It's a big prayer. It will change everything. This will be a change everything moment. If you're willing, would you put your hands out? And would you repeat after me? Lord, take me. Lord, bless me. Lord, I willingly give you permission to break me. Lord, give me away. And let me see Jesus. Amen. Can you applaud the Lord, everybody?